Welcome back. I hope you had some time to stretch your legs and, and back and so on. But let's continue here in, in Traforum with the agenda. Next up, we have uh, Mari Rütli and Ilya uh, Dmitrovsky from our longtime partner, Nortal. Uh, Mari is a QA specialist there, and Ilya is a senior QA specialist and test automation architect. Uh, Today, they will share their approach how to tackle complex multi-service world obstacles like end-to-end -end tests, for example, and what tools they use for that. So, uh, Marie and Ilya, I hope you are ready. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and hi, everyone. It's uh, nice that you have joined our presentation about uh, how we do end tests in a multi-service world. Uh, we will try to give you an overview uh, how have we approached the challenges that we are facing when we are doing test automation in a project which has uh, many event-driven microservices and also has a large number of uh, third-party external services. But before we dive in, let's introduce ourselves uh, a little bit more. Uh, so, I am Ilya Dmitrovsky, and I have been working in QA field for the past nine years, um, mostly in private sector, uh, testing media and uh, aerospace applications, and also doing uh, team leading activities. For the past five years, I have been involved in test automation, building different frameworks, uh, helping uh, teams and projects to uh, find best solutions for their needs and their contexts. So um, I'm really into test automation myself, and I see this as a, as a great potential uh, in a QA field in general. Yeah, hello, uh, I am Marie Huitli. I am actually celebrating my 10 years in testing in a few days. And I have mostly spent my time on testing various uh, state-related uh, governmental systems. I'd like to think that I do my little bit to make Estonia a better place to live at. So first, I would like to introduce you to our dear system under test. Our dear system under test is uh, probably operating quite similar to many other Estonian state related uh, public sector systems. We have here a bunch of microservices. And as many other systems also do, uh, we have also a uh, grumpy old guy who is uh, old, uh, somewhat special, but very dear to us. And all these uh, parts of our system need to interact with each other. One way to do that is uh, by using asynchronous messaging. And for that, we have the so-called postal office, uh, meaning the message broker. Uh, asynchronous uh, messages are used when uh, when we need to <clears throat> communicate that some sort of an event has happened to all the other services. And the other way to communicate is um, by using direct uh, synchronous REST requests. This is mostly used when, uh, for example, one microservice needs some specific data from the other, and also uh, synchronous uh, requests are used when um, the UI talks to the uh, back end. So this means that basically everything that a user can do in the UI, for all that we have a specific uh, respective uh, API endpoint. Our application is also part of the thing we might call the Estonian state uh, ecosystem. Because in Estonia, it's literally prohibited by law for the, any of the governmental bodies to ask the same data from the citizen twice. So instead, the, all the different systems need to communicate and get data from each other. <clears throat> so to enable this, uh, in Estonia, we have this thing called XT or XROAD. This is both a uh, technological and uh, organizational platform. For, for the members to exchange data. So, and, uh, so that our application could talk to XT, um, inside our application, most of the communication is done uh, by REST and 
in the form of JSON, but outside uh, there is uh, still good old SOAP in use, uh, which means XML. So we have a special microservice that does most of the translations. And in order to get access to the XD, uh, there is this mandatory security server that acts as a gateway. So as you can see here, we have microservices, message, mes messages, uh, we have REST, we have JSON, we have SOAP, we have XML. This is like plenty for us to chew on. Yes, exactly. And uh, as most of you in testing and in test automation know, uh, we face different kind of challenges each day. And um, I, I would even argue that these challenges that we are facing on our daily day uh, work are what makes this field so very interesting. Um, but let's now dive into some of the challenges that we have been facing and also how we have um, tried to solve those challenges. Uh, Event-driven architecture, um, this poses um, some challenge regarding different timing uncertainties for us because events happen in different times and we usually are not uh, sure what is the specific time that something is about to happen. Uh, but in, in test automation, it's uh, really um, good to have a deterministic outcome even not only for the, for the functionality itself, but also for the timings. So um, we have here uh, implemented a uh, polling system on our endpoints. So basically um, the tests themselves uh, try to figure out if, uh, if the expected outcome is now uh, done or, or not based on the uh the, the time that we have uh, predefined before how long the polling should actually take place um we we have uh, no specific uh, weights or uh, thread sleeps for a single uh, requests defined instead we have this polling system implemented so that um the the one request can be uh sent uh, multiple times to the to the specific service and once the um, expected result is returned, we pass on and go on with the next uh, step actually. Um, this helps us to avoid somewhat uh, well-known anti-pattern of having uh, static thread sleeps or waits uh, directly uh, for a single step. Yeah, the second challenge, uh we find quite interesting is actually the quick development cycles. We have uh, two week sprints, probably similar as many other do. And during that time, development is taking place on multiple microservices in parallel. Uh, so there are countless uh, code merges to the stable branch. And this kind of development pace gives us the uh, uh, the assignment to find out whether any of these changes uh, impacted some of the business critical scenarios or not. So the uh, tests have to be quick and we really need uh, stable feedback from them because no one um, <clears throat> has time to waste on false positives uh, from flaky tests. So in order to have these uh, rather stable test runs, we have made this uh, strategical decision that uh, we use uh, only the REST API endpoints, more specifically the, uh, the same endpoints that the UI uses. Uh, another thing regarding feedback time is to build the tests so that they could be run in parallel. Uh, this uh, reduces the execution time like considerably. Uh, once we enable test parallelization, uh, the execution time dropped about 75 percent actually and currently we have like around uh, 300 steps uh, which are executed less, uh, in less than three minutes uh, the stability of the tests is of course something that we are constantly working on uh, because um, we need the confidence in our test scenarios and to um, ensure the stability we are reviewing always both the uh, test code, the test scenarios, and we also test the tests. So how would you test the test? 
well, basically similar to anything else. Uh, we are uh, first we are creating failing conditions and running the tests uh, so to see if they can catch these artificially created issues and uh, to check for the flakiness. Uh, we have the tests um, up and running in uh, a continuous loop for some amount of time. The time depends on multiple variables, but mostly we consider the complexity of the test scenario. For example, we have had uh, one test uh, up and running for uh, about a week before we were confident enough that now this uh, test is good, not flaky, and can be merged. Time and resources. These are the things that uh, usually the time is not enough and the resource is not infinite. So uh, we, we have to, considering this, basically we have to pick the right uh, uh, tests that we want to do on our context and, and, and which kind of test suits our context best. So in our context, actually, we have picked end-to-end uh, -end tests, uh, which focus on um, full uh, business critical scenarios. And we have additional twists in there as well. Uh, when we create those kind of scenarios, we try to think how can we flow um, from um, uh, through as many microservices as possible, because this just gives us like the extra uh, layer of the coverage itself, uh, besides the business critical uh, scenarios. Yeah, and the next hardcore challenge is uh, the data from external services, because we are part of the uh, state ecosystem. Uh, our system constantly needs to interact with others but we cannot control the data and um, the limitations of data can interfere with the actual test scenarios we can conduct. So we have uh, implemented a mocking service. We have uh, picked uh, Wiremock for that. And uh, this helps us uh, both with uh, the automated end-to-end -end tests, but also when a human being, maybe a uh, a QA, a developer, whoever uh, needs to run some test scenarios, then mocking is uh, something that uh, is of assistance. So, and we have covered the main challenges. Let's uh, look into what the testing framework actually looks like. Yes, exactly. And here we will try to talk a little bit about the building blocks of the uh, test automation platform itself. So, um, First, the core component in, in most automation, automation platforms is the framework itself, which, uh, in which we can manage the tests and test cases themselves. We have a general purpose and in-house build framework. This allows us to be quite flexible in regarding uh, what kind of capabilities we uh, need to use. And also if we, um, discover that there are some uh, issues, then we can quite easily uh, fix them ourselves or just switch the uh, used component or the library uh, with the working one quite, uh, quite easily. The framework itself is written in Gotlin and the test code itself is also written in, in, uh, in Gotlin. Uh, the framework uh, project is Gradle and Spring Boot and as already mentioned it contains different kind of uh, libraries inside and um, here let's focus on some of the main uh, and most relevant libraries that we have in there uh, first we have spring boot included in there uh, this gives us uh, actually um, a wide variety of different capabilities first uh, is the possibility to connect to different databases to execute queries and get information back and also update and, and, and inject data directly to the database. Uh, then we have uh, Docker management coming also from the Spring Boot because uh, it has nicely built in uh, Spring Boot capabilities, which allows us to create Docker images and push the Docker images to the Docker registries. Um, in our context, we have multiple environments where the test needs to run. So um, we also need to have um, a configuration management. So uh, Spring Boot also allows us to 
quite easily and nicely have different configuration files and uh, in general just uh, really nice configuration management built in right away um, then also the last point about spring boot is um, it allows us quite easily manage uh, dependencies and dependency injections directly in the code already uh, the next component which is also really important and the big one is cucumber um, this is just to glue together the business side of the scenarios which are written in, in Gherkin to the actually implemented uh, code that's written in, in Gotlin. Then we have uh, JUnit. Uh, this is actually, I, I assume most of you know what uh, JUnit is. This is a, a really big framework on its own, but uh, we use just some of its capabilities um, just to enable different parallelizations and um, how we exactly run the tests is uh, managed uh, through JUnit itself. Uh, then we have uh, a search J, uh, which is creating rich set of uh, assertions. Um, and this is just to complement the different um, um, asserting capabilities that are coming from the next component, which is uh, which is uh, rest assured uh, and rest assured we are using for the for the web requests and also of course it has some basic validation capabilities which we are using but with the previously mentioned uh, component uh, assert j we are able to do much more complex uh, set of assertions as well yeah so these are the fundamental libraries uh, of the framework itself but of course there are many others available uh, which here I will not talk uh, in detail but because there are just uh, too many of them uh, the next is uh, test platform architecture uh, our test platform architecture actually contains of uh, quite of uh, quite a lot of different components but uh, there are two main ones uh, the test framework and the application under test itself uh, and then we have uh, support tooling available as well. So here is um, one component which we call Testlib. This is, this is also um, implemented in-house uh, and this is for creating different preconditions. Uh, then we have Wiremock. Uh, Mari will talk about this in more detail later on, but uh, this is for creating stops on demand. Uh, then we have support tooling, which is report portal, and this is just for aggregating different test results. And also this is for um, to enable uh, everyone to easily access the test results and also view some statistical information about it. Um, simplify tool across this diagram is uh, something looks something like this. So the test framework uh, start executing the tests. Uh, and it contacts the test lib, uh, which then uh, creates the preconditioned data in the database and sends the uh, needed events to the message broker. Uh, then the microservices uh, access the message broker, uh, pick up the messages, and then go to the database and check out the data. And after that, our precondition on the application side is basically completed. Now, the next step is that the test framework actually sends the information directly to Wiremock as well. So to create the needed stops uh, for executing the tests. Now, when all this is done, uh, the tests are able to now start uh, test scenarios uh, directly against the application itself. Uh, and usually uh, in, in most scenarios, at least uh, the microservices one or another uh, needs to contact those third-party external services and uh, this is why we have wiremock here and then uh, the application directly uh, connects the wiremock and gets the um, pre-made uh, stops from there uh, once the tests are done uh, the report is visible in the report portal and um, as we also send a lot of uh, logging information there um, it uh, is really helpful for us to be able to debug uh, issues when they 
arise. Uh, parts of the CI. So uh, we have uh, two uh, main parts to it. So first part is uh, to uh, execute or to build uh, the test solution when, uh, when the tests are stable enough. Um, to build the test solution means that basically the solution is built and then packaged as a Docker image and then pushed to the Docker registry. Um, this is actually really crucial because we don't want to have uh, different environmental variables and uh, uh, environmental dependencies to interfere with our uh, test solution. So uh, it is nicely packaged in a, in a Docker uh, image. The second part of it uh, is uh, one, once the packaging is done, the microservice uh, pipeline itself uh, is, is uh, executed. It has a job which is for uh, running the tests. Now the tests are pulled from the Docker uh, registry and executed. And these results are then, of course, uh, published to the uh, report portal itself. Uh, but here we really require that the tests run uh, quickly because we don't want the pipeline to take a very, very long time. We want to get the feedback uh, rather quickly. And of course, the tests themselves have to be uh, really stable. And that's why we have a stabilization phase for the tests as well. So since we have mentioned Wamok for like a thousand times already, quick intro. Uh, as we said, our application uh, needs to talk to the other state services all the time. So uh, we decided that uh, since we can't change the data at, at these systems, at these external systems, we uh, substituted them with Wiremock. And uh, Wiremock uh, is a simulator for HTTP-based APIs. It can be run as a standalone process, so, so all we have to do is have it up and running somewhere and uh, we can turn to Wiremock instead of going to talk to the security server. Uh, the most important concept of Wiremock, uh, we might say, is mapping. And mapping is um, pretty much uh, telling Wiremock that, uh, hey, if uh, you have this kind of request, then please give us this kind of response. Uh, it can be written down in JSON, which is really nice because that is uh, language agnostic and, uh, and people with uh, not much uh, development experience can handle this uh, too. To get the mapping to Wiremock, there are, um, let's say, two options. You can uh, just save them as the static files uh, at the same place where Wiremock is running. Or you can use the uh, administration API. So you can uh, have REST requests to send the uh, mapping to Wiremock. So uh, if, uh, if uh, a test or some human being uh, is doing any uh, more specific case testing, then you can post your mapping. Because we uh, mostly have the uh, static file mappings as the default layer of uh, responses to always get some sort of happy path response from the external service. Uh, so if our application actually does the request, Wiremock checks all the mappings it has, whether they were uh, uh, written in those uh, static files or, or sent by a REST request. And then if it finds a matching one, it sends back the uh, response from that mapping. And if the testing is done, then uh, the test or, or uh, a QA can just uh, pretty much delete the, uh, the specific mapping from Wiremock. So, have we learned something from all of this? Let's see. <laughs> so, um, the first uh, key takeaway. Simplify and be open to taking risks. If you already have a solution in place, um, revisit it and try to analyze if it's possible to make it more uh, simple. From uh, if, if it is really complex, then this makes much more sense. But even if you already have a simple solution, it's 
it still makes sense to revisit this topic uh, once in a while. This, um, going from more complex to, to, to less, you can, um, in certain ways, uh, reduce some costs. Um, you can even um, get some quicker execution times and maybe you even can uh, get rid of some of the infrastructure that you have been using so far. So um, try to think about it, try to analyze if it's possible to go uh, simpler. Maybe there are some uh, tooling out there that can help you uh, do that as well. But be careful uh, because um, this can also mean that you will, you, you may lose some of the coverage that you already have. So. Um, really make an educated decision when going uh, more simple. Uh, secondly, it seems that uh, quicker tests have um, equal pretty much happier everyone. Uh, if you look at developers, for example, they always need quick feedback so they uh, so that they could have their uh, work um, really streamlined. But uh, this can help everyone who has to deal with a test in a way or another. So no one has time or really wants to wait for hours to get the test results. So in our case, having your tests run under 10 minutes is already quite nice, but having them run uh, near or under five minutes can, uh, can actually be considered like really good. And the execution time of tests can be reduced uh, by using many different approaches, but um, but we find that uh, it's really important to keep this thing in mind from the very moment you start implementing your automation solution. Explore tooling, tooling possibilities. And uh, if you can't find the right tool for your needs, uh, it may be an input for you to create one tool for yourself. So um, one important point here is that uh, not everything can and has to be implemented in the test framework itself because some of the uh, tooling uh, use it, used separately can be really helpful for the other team members uh, if they are not using your test automation framework. Um, but um, this really needs to be thought through and again uh, context uh, here matters the most. Uh, if possible, uh, try to find the tools that are suitable for you, which are already present. But if not, uh, you can do them yourself or use your uh, uh, friend, uh, developer friend who can help you develop uh, the tool you need. Uh, next thing, uh, mocking, use it if you need it. Because, uh, uh, yeah, having uh, third parties can really uh, restrict the things you can test. So it's a ways to uh, substitute them with uh, maybe a mocking service. Of course, again, you need to be attentive that uh, you might miss if something changes at the third party. So, uh, but this, uh, well, is a risk you need to consider, and um, perhaps you can even mitigate it with uh, with some aspects uh, from contract testing. system and life and world. These are the really, really complex places. So find a way that is suitable for you at the end of the day uh, to figure out what meets your specific needs. And we really hope that some of you uh, got at least a couple of ideas regarding end-to-end -end tests you might use. And maybe some of you thought that, hey, my current solution is way better than all this. And this is also an important thing to know. So we really wish you all luck in finding out what works for you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the uh, experience. It seems like really well designed approach, and um, and I hope that uh, most of us or. or a lot of us learned uh, how to sleep uh, uh, better at night because we now know how to uh, tackle those obstacles that the real life uh, has to offer on a daily basis to us. Um, uh, I think there aren't any any questions uh, from uh, from workshop environment. 
But I was just curious, you mentioned a lot of uh, frameworks and languages. Was this uh, selection a, a straightforward path for you or you tried initially some alternatives that didn't work out that, uh, for some reason or just you know didn't uh, feel that convenient? Well, uh, actually the selection itself was uh, made uh, before we uh, already, but uh, the selection idea and the base for that was uh, quite easy. Um, the, the framework itself was uh, used already previously for uh, other tests. And now the language selection itself was uh, changed to Gotlin because it just to uh, simplify the writing of the uh, writing of the code in, in, in a great deal, basically. So uh, previously uh, coming from Java to Gotlin was just uh, a simplification measure, basically. And of course, regarding the components themselves, uh, the components were already in this framework before because this framework was uh, somewhat extracted uh, from the from the application, uh, how it, how the application itself was built up. Yeah, but it has gone through like uh, a lot of um, simplifications, let's say. Yes, a lot of refactoring and simplification has gone into making it. Uh, a test framework yeah okay great so but uh, are there any plans for further um, refactoring or, or are there any any you know shortcomings that you would like to maybe present us next year well yes we have uh, actually a lot of different ideas how we want to um, how we want to proceed uh, one aspect that we um, have mapped out and is really important for us is to go uh, and further simplify. Uh, this means from the framework perspective that we want to actually get rid of some of the libraries that we are using because um, uh, at some point of time they have um, showed us that we don't need them anymore and some of the uh, actions are now done already by uh, support tooling, which is which can be used by uh, everyone in the team quite easily. So uh, just the main focus is to uh, simplify and and try to figure out what uh, what makes the framework even more usable. Okay, great, great. Uh, I see that uh, we have some questions coming in. Um, um, and first one being that why report portal has been chosen? Are you using uh, uh, auto analyzer feature of report portal? Uh, currently, we are not using this feature, but uh, it is definitely on our agenda to uh, switch it on. Actually, yeah. Okay. Uh, why we okay. have uh, chosen this is um, because. Well, uh, there are other uh, similar tools, tools available, of course, in the, in the market, but um, we really wanted to try out and um, get, the, get the knowledge of uh, how this actually works. Uh, does it suit our needs uh, in, in a proper way? And so far, it has proven to be really, um, really like a cornerstone for us and, and really helpful. Okay. Great. So, so another question uh, from from the audience. Uh, uh, you showed that you insert the test to database. Do you have separate databases for each test run, or you use same shared database? Uh, we use uh, uh, one database per environment. So we have uh, separate environments, and each environment has its own database. Uh, and it's it's okay. not per per test. Okay, great, great. Uh, well, I think that's that's all all of the questions at this point, uh, uh, and and um, we can use the spare time for uh, stretching our legs uh, for some time. And uh, I, I really really enjoyed the talk, and uh, there were several uh, good points that uh, would need to um, you know take with me uh, as well. So uh, thanks for that, and uh, thanks for uh, Nortal for. Uh, for supporting uh, uh, Nordic testing days for several years already. I'm seeing that there is some questions coming in. Um, 
Maybe we can take one. Um, let's see. Uh, if if you're okay, we can take one more. Uh, how do you uh, argue for simplification when if uh, when slash if uh, uh, managers want to add features to the test system and which arguments seem to carry the most weight? Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's basically uh, you know about the simplification. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we we can quite easily argue uh, for the simplification because um, simplification in in large scale means that uh, we have to put in less effort to um, to write the tests and to to eventually also maintain the tests themselves and also to maintain the framework itself, if we go to the simplification route. So this is our main point, uh, why we really want to uh, go the simplification route. Of course, the systems themselves, which, which are under test, they get more complex each day, but um, we, we have to find this um, fine balance uh, where we cannot go more simple anymore uh, from our framework perspective. But um, uh, where we are now at this moment, we know quite well that at least we can go more simple. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, thank you for the short answer. I guess we can take the, the fourth one as well the, next to that. So what type of tests run in each services uh, pipeline, unit integration, API, end-to-end? -end? Uh, for uh, actually, uh, today we were talking about end-to-end -end tests. But uh, uh, beside the end-to-end -end tests, we also have uh, unit tests, of course, running there. We have uh, integration tests that are also running in the pipeline. And we have um, not that much, but uh, some uh, UI tests uh, made by Cypress as well. Okay, great. I think that's all. That's all for the questions. I I really really uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, we will share the slides afterwards, uh, and, and this is a wrap up for uh, Trafo Room uh, today. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, you can switch now to parallel sessions. There will be one session before lunch uh, still, uh, and and uh, I kindly invite you to also visit the expo area where. Nortal is uh, giving out a top notch Logitech stream cam. So um, thank you for joining and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event and take care.